This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Gail Green, Professor Emerita of English, Scripps College of the Claremont Colleges in Southern California. We will begin by taking a look at her recent book, Immeasurable Outcomes, Teaching Shakespeare in the Age of the Algorithm. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Gail Green, there you are, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Great being here. Um, wherever we are. <laughs> wherever we are in cyberspace. I'm in Tokyo. You're on the West Coast. I'm assuming somewhere uh, near Los Angeles. Is that right? Uh, are you out? No, no, no. North of San On the coast, north of San Francisco. Way north up. of San Francisco, north. way up. Yeah. So that's a different country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, even from where you... It's quite. Uh, yeah, you did yeah, your... Um, yeah career at Scripps College, in oh, yeah. Florida, which is right outside of Los Angeles proper. Yeah. So that's a different country. Right, isn't it? right, right. Yeah. Um, Quite different. <laughs> yeah, I have just finished reading your uh, fabulous book uh, entitled Immeasurable Outcomes, Teaching Shakespeare in the Age of the Algorithm. And when I began the book, uh, it began with a history that I'm sort of familiar with. You've done some extensive research on the history of the decline of the humanities. And I was thinking, well, I'm wondering when we're going to get to Shakespeare. And then we did. And we got to a lot of Shakespeare and very detailed um, explanations with with character, character driven <laughs> explanations of what happens in a classroom. And I, I thought, oh, this I get it. This is a lot of stuff put together because then we get a lot of your personal life, your memoir. So this is a cultural history. It's a memoir. It's a um, a, a bit of a uh, practicum on how to approach teaching Shakespeare or any other uh, humanities subject, author, whatnot, in the classroom. And yeah, operatic. And you can't just dip in here. This is you, you just have to read this from beginning to end. And in the end, I think we do feel that even with all the bad things that have happened, that maybe there is a, a possibility of a good outcome if we keep plugging away and arguing for the humanities. But may I ask you to give us a bit of an overview of your book? That's a nice description. I like the way you described it. Um, yeah, it, it did come about when I was sort of nearing the end of, of my career, and I'd had a, a wonderful time teaching. Um, and I saw that the humanities were being trashed every which way, you know, I mean, enrollments were plummeting. I mean, they have a bad press, um, really bad press out there, politicians dumping on them, cutting them, administrators cutting, all, you know, and it was very frightening to me. It was also, I took it kind of personally because it was my life's work, you know, and I never doubted for a moment that it was essential work. It was really great what was happening in my, I mean, I love teaching. So I set about asking, you know, well, what hit us? What the hell has happened? You know, that has changed the conversation so completely from when I was, was you know, an undergraduate. And even then people were saying, you want to study Shakespeare? Isn't that a little weird? You know, I mean, even then it was sort of seen as impractical. But the liberal arts was the cornerstone of an educational system that was the envy of the world, you know? I mean, the reason we turned out original, you know, groundbreaking technological scientific discoveries is because we asked our engineers to read, you know, to know something about the world. And so our educational system, which I always thought was really pretty terrific and so have rankings and so forth, you know, we're always like, you know, the top 100, we're the top 50, or we used to be, we're slipping in the rankings, actually, um, is now, you know, like a punching bag for Republicans, mainly, but also Democrats. Anyway, it, it scared me. It really scared and alarmed me. So I set out to find out what it is. And also to look, you know, I did some soul searching. Okay, well, what 
the courses are fun. I love them. But what use are they? You know, what value is what goes on in the humanities classroom? And that's where the book began. And just to give a rough overview, it starts with the first day of class, ends with the last day of class, but gives the last word to the graduates and alums. Yes. I mean, yes. I, the last chapter is a lot. It's called Ask a Graduate. And if you want to find out the value of something, you ask the, ask the man who drives one. There used to be an old ad about Packard. Packard, do they even exist? They don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. Ask, ask the person who has got the education, you know, what it's yeah. worth. And I just got eloquent answers from from um, my students, our graduates, our alums, you know, anyway, that was, that part was really fun interviewing students. So that's kind of an overview. Let's talk a bit about your personal life and background because you, you lived this and this cultural history. And we have a chronicle really uh, in this book of, of what happened during your own career. The story of my life is as it relates to public education, as it relates to education in the latter part of the 20th century. And I realized uh, writing this that I, of course, had lived through history, as we all, as we none of us realize when we're doing it, only in retrospect. And I was born into this sort of sweetest spot. And I, you know, uh, came of age in the middle of the century when enthusiasm about public education was at a height. And we had just won the war. We had won World War II. We felt really good about ourselves. We were full of sort of um, enthusiasm for um, improving a lot of other people as well. You know, I mean, this was the GI Bill where we sent really millions of farm boys, you know, kids who were straight off the farm to school. And it was enormously successful. It was the time that we uh, instituted our social security program. And, you know, there was, as I talked about later, the so a kind of social safety net. Um, and I, I came into this, into the educational system, into UC Berkeley, the year after the master plan had been put in place. I didn't know this, of course, I was a mere sophomore. And I, um, it never occurred, I didn't have to apologize for studying the little liberal arts. The liberal arts were uh, the cornerstone of this educational system. I mean, they were, uh, you know, the farm boys to, and the GI plans were studying the humanities, much to the surprise of many people who thought they would go for the technological um, majors. They didn't. They actually wanted to study things like Shakespeare. Well, I did too. And it was, you know, it was just a really good time to do that. There was no no need to apologize for it. Of course, it had to do with post-war prosperity, this optimism, just as, well, you know, we were a prosperous country then and we felt we felt good about ourselves. Um, the problem, uh, so, you know, there was this wave of exuberance. The problem was that we were, education was actually too successful. We began to feel entitled. And what entitlements, you know, used by Republicans to mean, you know, free handouts or something, what it really meant was the standard of living, and not only for ourselves, but for other people. Unions were strong. We expected workers' rights, but we also expected uh, other people's rights, you know, and this is when the great social movements that they came out of the universities, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and then eventually the women's movement and the environmental movement. Well, this was alarming to big business, to uh, corporations, because, you know, unions, <laughs> I mean, salaries cost money. Um, quality of life costs money, and we were getting very feisty. And you could see that, of course, when the demonstrations uh, happened, and that gave the excuse to kind of crunch down on them. Ronald Reagan said he would stop them at the point of a bayonet if necessary. I mean, it was very violent. He put down those demonstrations violently. He ran against, uh, you know, he ran for governor against the University of California. The first thing he did was fire Clark Kerr. You know, I mean, he was really quite ruthless about it. Um, but behind him was was money, was a lot of money that wanted to stop, was corporate America that really wanted to put a lid on these demonstrations. Mm -hmm. They're very anti-education, not only higher education, because look what happened when, you know, all these millions of graduates came out of, you know, the big state systems. They started making social movements. 
They made the women's movement. Well, that came actually later. They made the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the women's movement, and the environmental movement. Now, that stuff costs money. And you don't want people who critically think. And, you know, there are documents that say this. You know, they're a threat to free enterprise. They're a threat to... We have to stop them. And it was a concerted effort to put the brakes on the humanities, especially the humanities, because STEM, that's okay. You know, we can use the engineers... We can't use the critical thinkers. They didn't want us. Anyway, so that's a very ugly story. And that was kind of uh, folded into my own, you know, happy story, which was really landing in a wonderful place, a small liberal arts college that let me teach what I, um, oh, Andrew Del, Del Banco calls us a relic. <laughs> We're, you know, a somebody who has tenure, somebody who can structure their own courses, somebody who's protected by academic freedom and tenure. I mean, really, I, I landed in a sweet spot. You know, I really landed in this, you know, I got my education free. I didn't get my PhD from Berkeley. I should have, but I, I went on to Columbia and, um, and that was, that was not, I mean, Berkeley was the exciting place. Let me put it that way. But, um, yeah, and so Scripps uh, was a pleasure to teach at because these kids were, also I was a feminist and Scripps is a woman's college. And so I was, you know, the courses I was offering and, and, and structuring and working out were very welcome at Scripps. I didn't have to fight that battle of, you know, being a woman, being a feminist. Many of my friends and colleagues did. They had terrible battles. I didn't. So... It was, it was really nice. And then the other thing that happened is they let me kind of change subjects, which I did about five times mm -hmm. um, because literary criticism got a little uh, theory cluttered for me. I, I wasn't too fond of, um, I didn't want to read De Lacan and Derrida. And I, I didn't, those, those were not, they were not very interesting to me. So I started writing about Kind of real world subjects like biography and mm -hmm. memoir and um sort of some, some sciencey writing like uh, about sleep sleep research yeah <laughs> and yeah. and my college was, was quite wonderful about this they supported me they said she's publishing she's out there in the world you know why not why should she be writing another article about Shakespeare. I haven't written about Shakespeare in about 30 years. This is mm -hmm. coming back to Shakespeare and writing about Shakespeare was was really interesting to me because, of course, I still love him. Huh? He's yeah. still the best we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, for our viewers uh, in, in Japan internationally, I wanted to describe the environment. You know, I did a master's degree at the uh, gra graduate school, Claremont Graduate School. Yeah, and, I saw that. Uh, that was, uh, uh, you were there. Uh, and we just didn't cross paths. Was I really? Who did you? I have to. We I, have to do the who did. <laughs> I worked probably most closely with Al Friedman, uh, who was in the okay. school. And yeah. uh, let's see, Bill Spingham, yeah, uh, Wig, Wiggum, um, and mm. uh, Wayne Grow, Marshall Wayne Grow. Uh, and these guys were, well, at least uh, two of them were well along when I got there, maybe, you know, or let's, yeah. let's call it early right. 80s. Right, right, right. Um, but. Mm -hmm. You're in, uh, uh, really, yes, it is It is a throwback a bit because you're in a cluster of colleges, and yeah. it's a brilliant yeah. idea. It really it's, is. It's Boy. based on the Oxfordian Cambridge yeah. Uh, yeah. example yeah. of yeah. putting together, you know, several colleges and, in a sim and, and bringing in people from all kinds of backgrounds. So yeah. you have Harvey Mudd, you know, the trainer of astronauts, and uh, my roommate was a Mudd graduate. And yeah. uh, he was just outrageously brilliant. They, they uh, are yeah. just, and yeah. he he switched. Yeah. He had all the science, all the math he wanted, and all the science, and he went to get a PhD in history. And mm. he could do that without having to move very far. There was that yeah. was there for him at the graduate school. Yeah, yeah. There was Pitzer, yeah, yeah. the arts, the school that you thought about arts. There was close uh, back then Claremont Men's College, which is now Claremont McKenna. But that had the kind of, right. you know, yeah, let's say jockey type guys uh, who might be more of a you know, political science heading towards that kind of um, sort of at that time male oriented. Uh, and then the institution of P Pomona, absolutely wonderful faculty throughout. And then you have over there uh, Scripps and the Motley where we would go. <laughs> 
and uh, and you would hope oh, you, you might you would hope you might strike up you know I'm a young man you hope hope you might strike up a conversation with one of the right. uh, the polite you know well uh, well deported uh, young people there at Scripps uh, it was uh, there were a lot of dance majors there were humanities majors but very bright I guess what I'm saying is there was everything for everybody and there still is. Yeah, it's just right, it's just right, the, the right. whole idea that whole idea has been under attack of uh, the integration yeah, of all yeah. these disciplines through institutional affiliation okay. and the ability to move you could take classes yeah, yeah. here and there you didn't have to you had mud students in your uh Shakespeare class for instance yeah, yeah. oh I love every they're mothers we call them mothers mothers yes <laughs> mothers um, no they were absolutely great I, I sometimes look at my pre-registration and I think holy mackerel how are these kids gonna ever go together and then you realize they go together better than anything because they're so interested in each other they've never met anybody like you know the returning 52 year old black woman from Pitzer, you know yeah. who is quite outspoken the uptight computer guy from you know, mud and the you know laid back dance mate i mean it, it really worked you know i mean they they're interested in one another and they learn from one another and yeah you described the mix at at claremont really well yeah and um yeah and the brilliance there's a lot of brains there too a lot of brains there. And I mean, Pomona is always like, you know, a, a Harvey Mudd <laughs> is like, I think it's number one on the list of, you know, um, uh, salaries, straight out of co college yeah. salaries. I hate these lists. I absolutely hate them. But I'm always amused to find out. And that's because it's got a liberal arts base and a really good science, you know, second to Caltech or maybe rivaling Caltech in the, in the oh, state. Yeah. And uh, and Pomona is like, in the, in, and actually CMC also are in the top 5% of liberal arts colleges. Oh, yeah. So, it, I mean, we really run a tight ship. Yeah. And the the, um, the cluster is, is a brilliant idea. It's absolutely brilliant. And I it's, it's sad that more colleges can't do that. But, you know, we are physically, you know, so a student can take a Harvey Mudd class and then run, you know, run right over to my class in Shakespeare. You know, it's right, you know, they don't have to get on a shuttle bus or no. schedule so that one is... Yeah, it's really easy. It's it's uh, you can walk it. <laughs> yeah, you can walk. Anyway, it. it's a big plug for the Claremont colleges, but let's do it. You know. Yeah, and I think the, uh, of course, as you were talking, I remember one professor, not part of the graduate school, saying at that time that he uh, privately to me, because I guess I look like the guy you can tell this to, that he really didn't take women <laughs> women seriously as scholars. And I'm going, well, I'm not going to study with oh, this guy. God, but uh, I yeah, know. And this this was I getting know. up to into, well, it scripts, lasted a long time. So there was an illiberal Ill element. Did. And yeah. you came in through all of this. There was and, some tough stuff for a woman striving to be received as an intellectual uh, in your in your day when you were in graduate school. Well, it, it, yes. I mean, it's true in a way, although Scripps was very welcoming. I mean, they wanted, you know, women who were out strong and and scholarly i was always very you know i, I wrote and um it, it's it was around the other colleges where you pick up this patronizing attitude sometimes it's just very funny i don't know i always found it funny because i had the support of my own institution that mattered a whole lot mm -hmm. um but i remember the first paper a public paper i ever gave <laughs> was on anna karenina Mm -hmm. And uh, a CMC professor who had slept most of the talk because I could see who, you know, and he woke up afterwards at the end. He said, I want to say something. I want to say that Tolstoy was a great writer <laughs> and his portrayal of women was great. And I'm like, I know. Anyway, that was a, the tenor. And that was the tenor of the times in terms of conferences as well. You would go out and give a give a paper and you get it attacked but it, you know i didn't really mind it because i did have the strength of support from a from my own college um, yeah and, and, and other feminist scholars and, and attack we finding our voices uh, attack uh beyond any uh tie to what you just said right uh that there was just something coming mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh and a lot of this was coming from the east 
uh, and some of the stayed, let's say, Ivy League schools of the okay. East. Uh, it wasn't a California oh, yeah. thing, at least not in the uh, intellectual area. And it, it, it surprised mm -hmm. me because I, uh, I I thought I was going to California. You know, I'm from the American South. Maybe we can expect this. Thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, I'm going yeah, to California yeah, now and yeah. then to boom, run right back into that. But I, <laughs> I want to make it abundantly clear. This was 40 years ago for me and things have changed, uh -huh. um, yeah. um, you know, a lot. You know, all, all the faculty in the graduate school uh, program I was in were men yeah. at that time. Now you would not find yeah. that you'll yeah. find much more diversity. Right. And I'm on the, you know, alumni right. newsletter and I see what kinds of things are going on. Okay. And, yeah. uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. completely different place and a very fine place still, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, all the way through all of those colleges. And, and, and I think the graduate stu school, too. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about this. That OK, yes, from the conservative type side, from the uh, Philistine press, <laughs> let's just go to the old words, Philistine press from the utilitarians, from the people who uh, say, OK, graduate, get your job, live in a uh, cubicle, retire and die. Uh, and and that's yeah. that's what your life's all about. You know, we're going to uh, you're going to be plug and play and we're going to uh, make sure that uh, nothing else happens. And uh, what joy, what joys there must be in that. But uh, uh, you're protected a bit from that at Scripps, but it's moving and it's moving quickly and it it breaches the walls and, and gets in, in there. And what surprises me is an, it's a, adopted in a way by a fairly liberal educational uh, industry that creeps into academe and also an administration, an explosion of administrative jobs where suddenly teachers are being told what to do by people who have never taught that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm very, yeah. The managerial administrator, you know, that's brought in from business to kind of shape things up. I mean, it, I, I, I had a whole chapter that I had to drop because I had to cut so much from this book about how education is not business. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're not turning out a product or if we are turning out a product, it's a human being. And that's quite different from something that comes down an assembly line, you know, and it can't be chopped up and predicted and you don't want it to be. I mean, it's uh, human. It's immeasurable. It's exciting. It's unpredictable. It's creative. I mean, no algorithm can, you know, can do it justice and and yeah it uh i mean we have to resist that i mean liberal arts is a site of resistance i mean they have to resist the quantitative chopping up of human life you know into as you say plug and play and then you die i mean that's like not <laughs> i mean that may serve the interests of 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 corporations and it does i mean you want widgets and corporations you don't want thinking people i mean you actually do if you want to excel i mean you want creative people but you probably don't know that because your management is geared to a certain anyway um the liberal arts has got to stand up for qual qualitative measures you know quality quality of life. I mean, we're producing human beings who have lives to live, children to raise. These human, our graduates raise the next generation. That's something really interesting to me because I'm on Facebook with a lot of former students mm -hmm. and I watch their kids grow up and mm -hmm. I think, oh my God, she looks just like so-and-so did, you know, when, when she was my student. <laughs> and that's really fun. But those, I mean, so education ripples out, you know, what I taught her name happened to be Claire, the one I'm thinking of, um, is going to, you know, it's going to be in her kids. It's going to be in her profession. I mean, she happens to be a lawyer and she's on the right side of things. And I'm so proud of her, you know, and that's what we, <laughs> that's what we produce. And, and, and it's human and we have to, and it comes back to the humanities, right? You know, humanities have something to do with human beings, humane beings. Um, and it has something to do with, fighting, resisting dehumanization, which is mm -hmm. just blighting our culture. I mean, yes. we're just, it's just very hard to um, be reduced to a number and you can't resist it. I mean, you yeah. you know, you deal with your healthcare system and you're a number, you're a statistic and students are talked about as though they're data points or numbers on a graph or test scores. Yeah. They're not they're human beings. And that's why we need small classes, interaction, 
professors who are sufficiently well supported so that they can, you know, spend time with their students and get to know their students and treat them as human beings. Because if you treat them as human beings, there's a better chance they might turn out as human beings you know, and treat other people as human yeah. beings. And that's kind of the whole argument of my book. Um, and why Shakespeare is so wonderful, because he's, of course, the center of kind of humanism and Excuse me. a humanistic writer, um, if there ever was one. <laughs> well, that, well, it's the the thing about Shakespeare, and let's do get, we, we, we will have people here who are very interested in your uh, approach to teaching Shakespeare. And we're putting Shakespeare into this much larger mm -hmm. Uh, kind of crumbling architecture of the humanities uh, <laughs> uh, studies that you know we, we range back to classical in, antiquity. Um, and I, can, I don't want to get on a pulpit. This is your your our guest, but th this th this was the foundational principle of the university of so Socratic reasoning of anything that we ever wanted to do. However, let's do get to your Shakespeare. You're teaching how the the art of of teaching a class of small all students, you know, bringing in their lives from the world, some of them well-adjusted, some not so well-adjusted, others trying to find themselves, exploring their identity in the, it's these formative years and how Shakespeare fits with that and that mm -hmm. reckoning for young people. Right. Uh, it, it's really quite a challenge. I mean, you know, like the Claremont Colleges are well, they're a bubble. They're always called a bubble because they're isolated, you know, from the world and stuff, but they're really not. I mean, they, as we've talked about, they, these kids are incredibly diverse and, um, and you have to like find, you know, the ball to pitch to them um, and how to pitch it. And, and the point, you've got to reach them where they live. I mean, and Shakespeare can do that because Shakespeare writes about, human beings and relationships and conflicts and problems and families. And I mean, it's all there. I mean, there's so many ways into a Shakespeare play. Uh, so you make it relatable. I hate that word relatable. I don't mind when they say, you know, I can't relate or I'd like to relate. That's perfectly legitimate. But when they say Shakespeare's not relatable, that means you haven't found a way to relate or I haven't found a way to help you relate, you know. Um, and so you, there's so, so many points of entry with Shakespeare. I mean, you can start with, well, let's see. The first time I taught Lear, I thought, okay, this is, I mean, this is the first time. I'm like a total, I'm a freshman <laughs> at teaching. You know, King Lear is about the decline of feudalism and the rise of capitalism. Well, the blank stares and everybody was asleep by the time I was finished with the pitch. But now you ask the question, okay, how do you feel when somebody asks you, how much do you love me? You know, how does it make you feel? What kind of a question is that? Mm -hmm. Why is it a bad news question? You know, what does it do to you? What are the possible answers to it? You know, and then you get into it. Like, I mean, that get, that gets them talking. So there's just many ways in into it. And there's many things you can do with it. For one thing, fun, pleasure. I mean, these are plays, you know, and play, and he's playing with the idea of plays. He's a player. He's an actor. He knows the uses of play, this, this playwright. And kids these days, I mean, a lot of them, when they come to us from K-12, so-called reformed school, where they've been taught that learning is drill and kill and bubble fill, which is the way they describe the multiple choice exams, and the drills and skills and literature has either been eliminated, I mean, because the you, you need all your time for testing in the system, because test scores are all that matter. Um, and so their acquaintance with imaginative literature is, is pretty is almost nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and what literature they've read, they've read it as reduced to kind of drills and skills, you know, so anything that can be tested. And, and the tests have to be computerized. I mean, I'm talking about public school reform, no child left behind, race to the top, and the common core. Thank you, Bill Gates. Um, and so they don't have a sense that this applies to their lives or that this is fun. And so you have to almost like breathe life back into the enterprise, into the classroom. I mean, I really, you know, like I make a joke and they don't laugh. And I have, wait a minute, what happened? It, and it's almost like you, I mean, once you explain a joke, it of course loses it. But, you know, co stand up comics will not 
come to campuses anymore because kids no. are so humorless. I mean, I'm generalizing painting with yeah. a very broad brush. Well, but well I mean, there's that think... group. There's that group that shut right. down. And the irony I'm... is I remember years ago in the South when I began teaching, if one of the kids in a smaller class announced at the beginning, I'm a Christian. Now we're in a room full of people who are Baptist, Methodist, you know, everybody, you know, goes, but they're the Christian in the room. You go, okay, we're going to have to shut down a portion yeah, here yeah. or else I'm going to be talking to the dean. And um, because I emitted a, a you know word or something that, that offended, and then there's kind of been a shift where it comes in from another yeah. side, right? And, and it's it's, yeah. very hard to deal with that. I yeah. mean, I, I retired some years ago, and I'm very glad I got out when I got out because it's only got worse. And you know, the, the horrible thing is, is that I see the humanities as as breaking down walls between people, making connections. I mean, people are able to see their commonality with other people. They're able to, you know, see that they're, we're all part of the same sort of human stew. I mean, that's really, Shakespeare shows that so beautifully because he's got kings and commoners and, you know, clowns and, and you know, very dignified people. I mean, he's just got all kinds. And in a class, a small class, you pro you you model that in a way. They see that they have something in common with somebody who they never thought they would, and they become interested in that person and that point of view. So along comes this woke movement and throws up walls. You know, suddenly we are holier than thou, and before it was PC, and now it's woke. Whatever you call it, it has no place in the classroom. It really doesn't. I mean, I just am very adamant about that. Um, I'm also adamant about trigger warnings and safe spaces. Of course, the classroom should be safe from abusive or, you know, uh, divisive language. Of course, that goes without saying. I mean, what planet are we on? But we don't need, you know, policing of our language, you know, and we, I mean, it, and, and these walls, suddenly they come up again and suddenly we're holier than thou. And it abs absolutely is counterproductive, it's suicidal more than kind of productive it's suicidal um, i'm, I'm I mean, hoping I'm, I'm feeling a bit of a pushback now but basically if you are you or me in that environment uh you don't get very far by within uh particularly if you're a younger scholar trying to advance uh mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. not help you to speak out against this sort of thing. And I think there's a lot of silence and, but I yeah. do think that there's some pushback. There's a resistance. It reminds me of the way uh, sometimes my colleagues in Japan, you know, we don't have these strident opinion makers and so forth, but you just feel this consensus building is it's almost mystical. And you're going, Oh, it's not going to succeed. We're going to move, move that demon away for a while. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes uh -huh. you can't get it to happen. Uh, right. So right. I do feel a little bit of that in listening to podcasts and so forth, that there is a, mm -hmm. uh, a sort of settled in uh, movement. I, 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 you know, and the trigger warnings you were talking about, and you know, we're, we're going to have, you know, someone is blinded on stage. They pull out an eye, you know, they pull out eyes. They kill children. Right. Uh, they, uh, you know, it's just, uh, they, you know, and bake them in pies and I mean, just all kinds of, uh, yeah. how do you even, you know, so here, here, here's where we're going. All right. Yeah. And as yeah. you pointed out, yeah. You see it, you know, you can go to Game of Thrones, you can go to any right. a number of, right. uh, you know, it seems right. that the theme now for new series, darker the better, right? And, right. Uh, and we're not right. going to get much darker than that, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. and, um, you know, killing your brother and marrying your brother's <laughs> wife. Uh, okay. But I, uh, I don't know. It just seems to be a kind of power play that comes from people that are, discontented about other things rather than yes, what, so we're that's what I think I think they're kind of terrified about their future and they should be yeah. I mean yeah, it's yeah. not it, it's really a um you know the, what's out there for them is not it's not nearly as welcoming as the world was when I came out um and that was pretty scary too but yeah. So they get really hysterical about you know that insensitive thing that somebody said you know and that's not where the problem is. I mean, the problem is, you know, drive a few miles, you know, any direction of those 
pastoral colleges, the Claremont colleges, and see the public schools that are boarded up because of this coup of the educational system. I mean, yeah. you know, and the, the, you know, the major universities like Penn and Yale and, you know, I mean, I mean, they're surrounded by these slums and that's where the problem yeah. is. But yeah, that, those are huge problems and they're intractable. And how are you going to tackle them? And it's much easier to tackle so and so who said that insensitive thing. And I think that's what's going on. Mm, um, I had to live in Pomona because I, yeah. could, I couldn't afford a place over on Foothill uh, on that on the other side of campus. And I didn't have a car. And and that's almost uh, I'm I mean there that's there are right. tiers of people and but be, beneath there the no. the bottom line are people who don't have cars in L.A. and having lived many years in Tokyo now uh, and not ever owning a car yeah. uh, when yeah. you're in okay so I'm getting out and I'm walking three miles to school and there's the ten freeway and I on the the side on the Pomona side you see out of a 30s movie or something a hobo camp. And guys, you know, with the fire, walk under the bridge, and on the other side is a little lady, uh, you, know, you know, raking her beautiful grass lawn. And they're, you know, just they're just this far apart, right? You know, right. and you go, right. wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the case with so many, and in particular, many elite institutions. You step well, around yeah. those walls, yeah. Uh, yeah. you're uh, you're in a potential horror show out there. I mean, yes. And when I went to Columbia, I lived about 25 blocks south and I would walk up Broadway. And in those, it wasn't gentrified. Now it's much gentrified. You yeah. walk up Broadway and there's nothing but banks and AT&T. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it was actually much more colorful in my day, you know, but it was kind of scary. I mean, it was really a gauntlet. You walked, uh, uh, to get to call, you know, to get to school. I mean, Columbia has all characteristically been surrounded by um, kind of horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but you do talk about, and I, I love, you know, uh, the moments where you describe these students, and there was a, I, my students are primarily Japanese, and uh, I'm in the uh, humanities. Most of the men just from historically in Japan, go to the STEM areas, the business and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. engineering sciences. We have some men, and I really appreciate having men in my class because it seems to balance. I've had all women's uh, seminars, and uh, but I would say 80% plus. We're really kind of in a women's college here, yeah. but yeah. they do get jobs because yeah. they have that one utility, if nothing else, good English skills and corporations in Japan want good English skills, but they also are very, again, very well deported, very presentable, very, just fine people, mm -hmm. uh, usually mm -hmm. from, from good homes. Mm -hmm. And it, it struck me, it struck me when I left the States and came here, I felt like, Oh, I'm a better teacher now. I may have learned something. And I realized, no, it was the, the students changed. I had better students. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I was using the same stuff, right? But you were yeah. up against some challenges and cultural changes, uh, I guess, in the uh, toward the end of your career, where you have these kids who are over medicated, who are yeah. uh, who are brought in, who are stuck in, a, you know, looking at something in their hand, and uh, and a, you know, yeah. part of that addiction. And yeah. the um, yeah. the uh, pathology that can come from that, yeah. and in many cases there were turnings within your sem. You could see them turning, or at least mm -hmm. coming out and getting better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a kind of reparative thing seemed to be going on sometimes, not all the time. Right. Well, it. Uh, yeah, the changes have um, that. I mean, the, the attention span is less. Uh, yeah the seriousness um i don't think the classes matter to them as much as they did when i first came to scripps when i first came to scripps it was like it was like a high you know i felt i was absolutely in the right place at the right time they wanted to hear what i had to say they had infinite patience my god the the amount of reading i used to i used to give i just couldn't i couldn't give a fraction of that now without losing 
every, you know, having no enrollments. So you assign less, you, you know, you move faster because their attention spans, they get bored. And so I find myself like getting, okay, they're done with the scene. I'm not done with the scene. I mean, I know there's a lot more to say about it, but we have to move on. So mm -hmm. I felt a subtle change in pressure because the attention span thing with all the distractions, all the gizmos, I mean, that's really been a... Um, a big change and pretty much everybody talks about that it's not and being able to assign less and the because they have so much else going on in their lives i mean they have so many pressures on them many more of them are working than did in my day um many more of them have family responsibilities because their families are you know i mean what we're dealing with is is a really bad economy so i've had kids who I'm sorry, I missed this week. I had to uh, help my parents move out. Our house was foreclosed. You know, I didn't, oh we didn't used to, I mean, when I taught in open admissions at Brooklyn College and Queens College, there were things like that that happened, but yeah. that, now it's everywhere. And um, I'm sorry, you know, my mother, you know, was, you know, tried to commit suicide this weekend. I mean, it's just oh my. horrible stuff like that. I mean, really, I, I would get these excuses. And and the thing of suicide is like real, you know, yeah. I mean, they live with it. They know people yeah. who've done it and um, in their high schools. I mean, kids, not, not, I mean, it's really a nightmare out there. And yeah. the mental health crisis is much talked about now and it ought yeah. to be talked about because it's a huge thing we have to deal with. And it falls on, um, a lot of it falls on faculty and faculty should be there for them. I mean, I, I mm. never minded talking kids through problems. I never minded that. But on the other hand, my classes weren't huge. I didn't have classes of 400. I didn't have, you know, I had a relationship with them. And so mm. it meant it was just an extension of a relationship, but the counseling services are way over, um, overcrowded and, and there need to be more of those. And yeah, I mean, there have been really bad changes um, because the society has, had, well, what's happened essentially going back to my, you know, how the humanities took a great fall. I mean, what's happened, what happened after World War II was a wonderful spirit of social responsibility. You know, we had pulled together and won a war and we were great we were we thought well of ourselves we thought well of other people we felt we had a responsibility and that's when medicare social security um you know national health service in britain god i, I wish we'd gotten one yeah. um and uh, you know the social legislation a social safety net so people didn't they weren't up against it now they're up against it i mean there yeah. is no social safety net you lose your house tough you know you yeah. you're on the street i mean yeah. i'm too bad for you you're disposable and that's what we're feeling in classes even classes as selective and as supposedly sheltered and buffered from the world as claremont N no place is buffered from this you know yeah it's sitting everywhere and so it obviously impacts the classroom in an, in an adverse way it makes it harder to get their attention harder to get them to i used to get them i had classes that went from seven to ten i could get them to sit there till 10 30 or 11 if we had something interesting going no way not anymore they're not out of anymore. their a meeting they have somebody to you know something else to do there's so many pressures on them yeah anyway. well it's still shakespeare though isn't it because you have yeah. both things you have uh, reading uh, a language that a uh, student and I've had students, you know, not all of them, but the, the better ones uh, and others who sort of uh, do turn the, the, the fascinating use of language and mm -hmm. how uh, reading is important. And then you get that extra uh, benefit. Of, these are dramas. These are stage yeah. spectacles. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that still can uh, pull in so many. It's still just a wonderful um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but the, the a body of text to bring in to uh, to explore. Uh, in in this uh, tough teaching environment, because if anything's going to catch their attention, and if you can grab them with Shakespeare, you do see people who uh, yeah. go yeah. through this uh, kind of dawning. As by the way, I did. 
more yeah. more in yeah. more in yeah. high school and yeah. i'm not so sure it wasn't yeah. uh kent's cursing of oswald but yeah. uh I, that got me i'm going yeah. wow okay i like this <laughs> There's something good i know, I, you I know, know being I a boy that. you know in high school uh, but, you know, there, there's so many little entry points, right. uh, doors to walk through. And you yeah. talk about this in your book a good bit through very graphic descriptions of of the personalities of your students. I'm assuming you're changing in names and so yeah, forth. Yeah, composite. Yeah. yeah kind of composite images. Yeah. But I, I see yeah. these kids and I have. So yeah. We know these kids. We certainly do. Yeah. I mean, the one who comes in trying to decide whether she's going to major in chemistry because her parents want her to do something practical. And the and then she falls in love with Shakespeare. And I didn't. Yeah. I I never leaned on her. I tried to get her to hear her own voice. What do you want to do with your life? Anyway, it was decided by the end of the semester because she was so taken to Shakespeare. I mean, she just loved it. You know, others they don't love it so much because language is not really where they live anymore. They live in visuals. I mean, so it's it's hard to get them to attend to the words on the page. You know, mm -hmm. let's look, you know, OK, you don't like Lear. Why don't you? Let's look at the words. What does he say? What does he do? What do other people say about him? You know, I mean, to teach them to attend to the words to read is kind of challenging. The wonderful thing that we today, thanks to technology, have going for us is films. Yes. I mean, in my day, watching a film, watching a Shakespeare production was a big deal. You know, you had to haul yourself to the theater across the bay in San Francisco, or you had to, um, you know, I remember when Burton's Hamlet was playing for two nights. Um, yeah. It was a film version. It wasn't yeah. him. Actually, and if you didn't movie. see it in a theater, you didn't see it. You know, right. It yeah. I know it was just really a big deal to see something, but now you can you stream, can, you know, yeah. a dozen different Hamlets. And I, I use that. I use the films a lot in my, um, in teaching yeah. and it reached, I mean, some of them who couldn't be reached by language could be reached by, by performance. And yeah. So, the same here. Yeah. So here, it's just such a wonderful, and we do have these yeah. classrooms now on the positive end. Where they're all outfitted with overhead projectors. Uh, right. You have the uh, ability yeah. to uh, yeah. move in and out and, you know, so show segments and talk about yeah. it, and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And next year, we're going to be able to use Joel Coyne's Macbeth or sections of mm -hmm. it and look mm -hmm. at Macbeth with a graduate class that I have right at the beginning. And everybody's excited about it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah uh and and that grabs you uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah so no i mean it's really yeah. I, you know, my, I, as I describe in the book, my Hamlet film assignment, where um, you're supposed to pretend to be the director. I mean, you uh -huh. have been assigned to direct Hamlet. And you can use pieces, bits and pieces from all these different productions, you know, who's, you know, the, who's going to act Hamlet and who's going to act Polonius and Ophelia. But you have to explain why you choose these, these elements. And then you weave them together into an interpretation of your own. It worked. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they love work. It. And isn't it amazing the stuff that we think will work a great idea when we're planning a class? Uh -huh. So we're going to get on syllabus right now, just for a moment. Okay. Have these great ideas and almost invariably they fail and fail horribly. Uh, like, you know, <laughs> and then something happens spontaneously in class. You say something, you're not even trying to make a joke and mm -hmm. there's an outburst of laughter and you're going, oh, this is the way, right? Right. But right. how did I know this three months ago when I was writing a syllabus you on could. what was supposed to, you, you got could. to have this flexibility. Absolutely. And when you try it the next time, it won't work, you know. <laughs> That's right. The same thing doesn't work again. Because uh, classes are living, you know, entities. They're like the relationships. You have a relationship with this class. It's unlike any other relationship with any other class. Yeah. And it's living. And that's what's wonderful about it. And and why when they try to can it into the syllabus or best practices. Ah, hate that term. I'll tell you what the best practices are. The best practices are what the teacher professor can get to work best, period. <laughs> and, that's, you know. that's it. Gail, could you explain what it is that we don't like about what we're asked to do with the syllabus? Well, we were not in the past um, it was not required of us that we account for ourselves, that we produce student learning outcomes that could be measured. 
we were trusted. Education was a public trust. Um, trust is a really important part of education, and it's social distrust that is made for this this um, accountability, uh, which is really bordering on surveillance. I mean, we're being we are under surveillance. Um, and suddenly, you know, we have to produce these student learning outcomes on, on our syllabus. But more than that, the syllabus is just bloated out into this. My, my syllabi remained at two pages, and I could get away with that because I was senior. Nobody wanted to challenge me, and everybody, you know, I was soon to retire. So I, I just turned into syllabi, two pages of syllabi. But my colleagues were doing these God awful things that were like they were supposed to be contracts. They're not contracts. They're not legally binding. There's no ground for that. But but that's what we were told. And they were like 18 pages. They were full of boilerplate. They were just junk. You know, they were supposed to cover every possible contingency. So as you say, you know, contingencies that well, I didn't tell you couldn't pee on the floor. But you know, I mean, they can't possibly cover every contingency for one thing. Um, and for another thing, they were simply not legally binding. That's a fiction. Um, but they, you know, were part of um, you know, just making us accountable and you know, controlling us, controlling the faculty. The other the thing is, is that students don't read them. I mean, the longer they are, the less they get read. Brevity is the soul of wit, as we know, as Shakespeareans. And I found that, you know, like with the two-page syllabus, they read it. I mean, because it had, you know, useful, vital information, like will there, will there not be a final? My answer to that was always a definite maybe. But, um, you know, <laughs> um, but it was just a, you know, and the sad thing was that everybody kind of went along with it. And oh, yeah, the other thing is that this didn't happen at Scripps, but it happened to colleagues of mine at the University of Minnesota and Michigan and stuff. Um, that they there was a committee and they had to send their syllabus off to the committee to be approved. And sometimes the committee had problems with it. So they would send it back to the faculty member and the faculty member would have to rewrite and resubmit it to the committee. Woo. I mean, what? what country are we in? I mean, it's something like, you know, Soviet <laughs> practice in a way. Um, so it's, it, uh, I think when you get ang angry or upset about this syllabus and I just ignored it, um, it, you know, we have every right to, because it's, it's incredibly offensive. Yeah. Well, I, we should, we should clarify. There's nothing wrong with making sure the students know the con what's going to happen in the class. Oh, absolutely. And, and to do that yeah. with a, a, some degree of specificity, they don't want to walk in and suddenly you're talking about Charles Dickens when they were expecting uh, Emily Dickinson or Shakespeare or anybody else. Uh, they, they'd kind of like to know uh, where you're going, if you're going to be teaching the, uh, what they expect you to teach and the ex expectations of the uh, instructor and so forth. And, and all these things that can be put on two pages. And the right, students exactly. will read. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And I found, you know, that for my beginning courses, I tended to be maybe five pages. I mean, they, they needed a little bit more, you know, more guidelines. But for a Shakespeare class, I mean, really, you know, a list of the readings, um, times are not, we're never certain in my class because I never knew how long we were going right. to be on a class. If we mm -hmm. got going into a play, we would stay on that play. If we didn't have much to say, we moved on quickly. And the writing assignments, that's a whole other thing because now there's AI to deal with. Uh, what is it? Chat uh, GPT, uh, which is extraordinarily good. Uh, is it? Uh, yeah. Have you, you've, you've uh, yeah, played, played with it a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, and that's that's coming. But I mean, calculators came. <laughs> well, I know. But uh, thing, typewriters, uh, you know, so what? Uh, spell checkers came, things like that. This, so, yeah. this, yeah. But you don't want this stuff to be right in your. I mean, I quick. This is an argument for small classes and professors who know their students. Yeah. And writing in class, where you and you know get class, a, you yes. you know what they can say, what they're capable of. Yeah. And yeah. you don't have to mess with this stuff. I mean, if you announce paper topics too soon, um, you're you know you're. But I've always known this. I mean, I've always wanted to know what they can write. I want to hear the sound of their voice. I want to get to know that voice and. That way, I don't have to deal with plagiarism. 
Uh, yeah. I'm interested in the fact that you started out with uh, Taming of the Shrew, Midsummer Night's Dream. Th th those were your priority plays. Taming of the Shrew is a terrific play to start with because it's so controversial and it's so, in a way, obnoxious, you know. And this is a woman's college. There's a lot of sort of heightened sensibilities and sensitivities in, in my classes. And Many of the of the students are simply outraged. You know, how could you assign something like this, this patriarchal, brutal play? And uh, is this the way they saw women back then? Well, who is they? And, you know, how did they see women back then? So we we fill in stuff like that. I asked them to Google the headless woman, you know, the silent woman and images of the headless woman come up. Anyway, we talk about stereotypes and what is a shrew and does a shrew get made or is a shrew born and Kate's situation there's all sorts of things to talk about in that play and it kind of you know I mean it's a critique of the patriarch I mean it demonstrates the patriarchy in action like crazy I mean Petruchio saying she is my ass my ox my anything you know I mean he's just stating law I mean he's absolutely right in that case um and she's hauled off you know to a to a you know, without her permission, she's married to this madcap ruffian and hauled off. And this is like social reality. I mean, this is what happened to women in the Renaissance. I mean, it's not so funny. But on the other hand, it's also a critique of the system because it's 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 exploring it. And it's also quite funny. I mean, if you play it for laughs, which I think you kind of have to to make it palatable at all. And what's really kind of marvelous about the play is that Kate learns how to re he, she learns how to live within this system. Now, many of my students are not never going to be happy with this play, and I'm certainly not going to try to force them to see it. Um, you know, I'm just going to show my way, which is that it is a play about play. I mean, it's a play in which the main character learns how to play. And you can see that on the road uh, back to Padua with Kate, with Petruchio saying, it is the sun, it's the moon, and Kate finally catching on and saying, okay, it's the sun, it's the moon, you know? And a hand goes up in my class and says, that's like my mom with my dad. <laughs> you know, anything you say, dear, <laughs> she's got it. That's absolutely it. I mean, Kate is learning to work the system to her own credit. So then we look at the last long speech where she talks to you know speechifies to her sermonizes really to her sister sisters on stage and to the offstage audience thy husband is thy lord thy sovereign thy keeper and whatever he says goes and so forth how is she going to say those lines now have we seen that to be a woman beaten into submission as many people saw her at the you know at the beginning of discussions well, maybe not. I mean, maybe this is a woman who's learned something about play. And why why are we talking about play anyway? Well, anyway, the play is a play within the play. Because remember Christopher Sly? He comes back into the picture. And, you know, actually he falls asleep and a play is performed. What play is that? This play that we're watching. What was the motto of Shakespeare's theater, the world's a stage, and all the play, you know, men and women, merely players. And so... I teach the play as a play about play and about laughter and about love and laughter um, and imagination. I mean, she has actually learned how to play a role. Now, as I say, many of my students are not so happy with that interpretation. And they, you know, they're in good company. A lot of people find this play unpalatable. But as Emma, you know, so it says, you know, you can, <laughs> there's a lot of space for interpretation in a Shakespeare play. And yeah. this leads into Midsummer Night's Dream, of course, which is also extremely playful. And in fact, I ask students to perform it. And that is really revelatory because yeah. they get up there and they don't have to memorize the roles. They can, you know, use their cell phones and yeah. Yeah. read the, read the lines. Um, but they learn and, a huge amount a, of that. A, I mean, a famous, they learn how play, a famous play within a play. Yeah, uh, right, there, yeah. right. And that is, they get into that with this kind of, you know, zany Monty Python humor of, of the artisan's play. And they, yeah. you know, they really get into it. If they don't get into it, I know I'm in for a long ride. <laughs> it yeah, means that the yeah. class has just got, got no sense of humor. But usually they do, <laughs> you know.
And um, so th this is, you know, I mean, it's also, you know, the argument that we can get into about both these plays, the battle of the sexes. I mean, how much, who shakes, whose side is Shakespeare really on? Well, that's not really, you can't answer that. And it's not really a particularly valid literary critical, you know, question. But it is like, it does get them lined up. Are these plays critiques of the patriarchal system or are they celebrations of it? Yeah. And the answer is with Shakespeare always, yes, <laughs> it's both and, yes. you know, it's not either or with Shakespeare. And that's one of the things that's quite wonderful about Shakespeare is he he uh, requires a kind of complexity of vision that you hold two points of view in mind at once. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which we need. I mean, because we tend to dualities and either ors and fundamentalism, we're really, really becoming fundamentalist, not only Islam, but but Christians, yeah, <laughs> and lots of people in the society, you know, my way or the highway. One thing I <laughs> appreciated about you, I, I said, uh, I'm glad Gail wrote this book because if I tried to do it, I would be it. It would just, it would just destroy me, I, and I would, <laughs> I would end up with a rant, and I'd have to go back uh, because you know, and it, everything you have, that yeah, there is um, a sternness there. This is what happened. This is yeah, how yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we of the people who were doing things time proven mm -hmm. through centuries of education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have had the exquisite privilege of mm -hmm. print technology and now internet technology and greater literacy and being able to reach more people, how someone and in time proven methods of instruction, mm -hmm. someone would come back in and try to, to destroy it or make these constant efforts to fix that which is not broken. Mm -hmm. which, that bothers me more than the destroyers. Everybody is just following orders. And the orders, I tracked this process down, where they came from. They came from the Bush administration. Yeah. Yeah, they did. They came from the same people who gave us no child left behind. Yeah. And they gradually filtered, you know, th through the regional assessment associations have taken their orders from people who are taking their orders essentially from business because businesses always wanted to manage education. Yeah. I mean, they wanted to turn us into a workforce because that's what we're good for. I start the book with a, a quote. I'm not sure public schools understand <clears throat> that we there are their customer. We, the business community, are their customer. What they don't understand is they are producing a product. Now, is that product in a form that we can use it, or is it defective and we're not interested? This is the view of the business community to education. He's talking, I believe, here about K-12, but it doesn't matter, I mean, because it applies to higher education as well. This is what I mean by dehumanization. Um, this is, I mean, my students are not a product and they're not an it. I mean, they're human beings. And it's this whittling down of the human being to a you know, part of the workforce, a widget in the workforce, a consumer, a producer, um, that makes the economy run. Um, and that my book is really pitted against. I mean, it's like rehumanization of a system. I mean, we, I mean, the humanities is about humanization. We have to resist <laughs> the tendency to dehumanization. Um, and we also have to teach something that's a bit broader than um, being a widget in the workforce, because there are huge crises on the horizon, as we all know, there's climate change, there's refugee populations larger than at any time in history. What kind of education are those people getting? I mean, they're huge, huge armies of refugees. Um, they're not getting a liberal arts education, I'll tell you that. Um, there's poverty, there's a wealth gap that's larger than it's been, you know, since the Gilded Age. Um, I mean, we are uh, exceeding the Gilded Age, actually. If kids come out, you know, with an accountant degree, knowing how to be an accountant, with a degree in pharmacology, knowing how to be a pharmacologist, is your friend's son, or I think it was a son, brother, <laughs> um, daughter, um, they're not going to they're not going to be up to these crises we're going to need people who can really think and who can connect and create 
we're going to need all the imagination and all the resources the human race can muster. So this is a whittling down of education and of a vision, you know, that's actually suicidal to civilization. It may be good for Exxon, but it's not good for the world. I think one of the best things that happened to us, even though it was a horrible thing, was the year 2008. And that was the last stand, I think, that this huge business, you know, stocks, banking, whatever, uh, I think that they should have been punished more than they were. Oh, they yeah. But the fact is, it made it abundantly clear that they didn't know their hmm, hmm, hmm from a hole in the ground. Yeah, but you yeah. know, it didn't matter because they're back doing all that stuff. That's thing. right. They do come back. You know, they just, <laughs> because they have the money and the power. Just crawl out from under the money. rocks and there they yeah. are again. Or, right, right. Uh, they, uh, and they, and they, uh, and they they just want to get in here. They see money, and mm -hmm. even what you're talking about. But even in the idea of, uh, you know, the whole kind of failure of these massive online educational programs that were supposed to, right. you know, bring around what I joke with a colleague of mine, the ideal institution, and that is. No, no faculty, right. <laughs> no faculty, and really no students. You know, not right. not, not gathered right. together. Right. Just a bunch right. of people right. paying money into a server somewhere, and that would be the perfect place. Uh, and and trying to generate profits from that because they see how you know these big tuition dollars, people paying for this. Yeah, but I don't yeah. think. Oh, that... and they're they're expanding. They're they're having, you know, especially since the pandemic, which drove everybody online. So the administrator yeah. said, "Oh, hey." Hey, look, this can work. Well, it doesn't work. You no, know, it I doesn't mean, work. I, and and that's, not gonna, it. that's not going to get through. It was, it was so abundantly clear. And you did you you weren't you were retired before the pandemic. Thank right? goodness. Yes. Good grief. You, I, mean, I, I didn't have to. You taught online, did you? Yeah, it was a, yeah. it's a form of mental illness. It's just a sustained <laughs> mental, mental illness that there was no therapy for for students and teachers, you know, where we're we're lost in the in the void. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm I'm teaching to avatars uh because my <laughs> students are Japanese and they're very shy about coming on. Oh. And, so they're uh, avatars. <laughs> yeah. And they just see these little uh, kittens and then over here, some kind of guy has a demon. And I, I don't even know what's happening back there. Did you uh, see that? I, I, I wrote an article for um, New American Pros New <laughs> What the hell is it called? The American Prospect, TAP, yeah, yeah. and about ed tech. And it starts, did you see that? That uh, it went, went viral. It's this sweet little, you know, woman who comes on. She says, I've written a song about what it's like to do online teaching. And it goes like this. And she strums her ukulele a few times and then screams. <laughs> it's this primal scream, like, of total frustration. That made the national news. I mean, yeah. that was played on news stations all over Facebook. And I just, and that's how I started this article. I'll send you a link to the article. Yeah, please do, please do. We'll put it. We'll put it up too. Oh, great! Uh, okay. Because I haven't, I haven't come across it because I was kind of grappling with your book. It's just out, <laughs> yeah. and Hopkins very gratefully did not price this as an academic book. Right. That it, was... it is. Uh, it is an affordable price that the mere mortals can buy. You know, it doesn't have to be an institutional purchase, and it's out there in Kindle also. Yes, the uh, online teaching thing was uh, uh, horrible. It was good that we could at least make some progress and right. not shut everything right. down. Right. So it was good in that I did have to organize my classes in ways that I'd never had before yeah. uh, because of it's just yeah. the very nature of things. And yeah. uh, there's some good technology out there that, that we in our earlier careers did not have. Uh, right. The Google Classroom. Right. And mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the some of my colleagues, I, I evaded this because I saw this coming. But there's always that kid who used to see you on campus and say, I'm so sorry. I could, you know, there was traffic or whatever. I could, couldn't make it to class today. Did we do anything in class today? You know, <laughs> yeah. to, to which you just went, you know, could <laughs> And then if you're, uh, you know, a, a male, I'm a fairly good sized male. If I start screaming on campus, it doesn't look good. I, you know, yeah, we did a couple of things and um, yeah. maybe go to one of your friends and get their notes or whatnot. Yeah, but yeah. now, Gail, we can put everything up there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The handout, everything. And yeah. uh, if, 
if uh, a little bit of a film clip, you know, that's not violating any copyright or whatever. And you go, just go to our classroom today and answer your little study questions. And that should keep you up a bit. Uh, everything but the classroom chemistry, everything, everything but the magic, but the classroom. you know, and what really, what really went on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's just a condensation. It's like an outline. It's nothing to do with, you know, it's like reading the score, a musical yeah. score, with, but you, you're not hearing hearing it. I mean, yeah, I think. But it's an I mean, answer. It's an answer you can give these kids who do miss the of class. Course. Of course. Yeah. They, and it's and, better uh, than nothing. It's a well, lot better. better than me carrying three weeks of handouts into my uh, teach the Bible <laughs> also and uh, have a lot of handouts. And then they're yeah. come in and say, did you have last week's handout? And I would have to right. look through a big bag. Right. So, no, yeah. it's, it's up there now. It's online. It's and there. No, that's, I mean, yeah. I'm so happy to be back, you know, in the oh, classroom no, now. No. You know. And I hope that's the general feeling and that people really do hang on to the person to person because that's, I mean, learning takes place, you know, between and among human beings. It doesn't, there's a, a, a an experiment that, um, it was a 2003 paper about teaching Mandarin to infants, mm -hmm. Western infants. And three, there were three ways. One was audio and one was screens and one was a human tutor, you know, to make those different, quite different sounds from English. And that it's hard to pick up when in later um, learning language. <laughs> and the only one that had any effect was the human tutor. The human mm -hmm. in the room, not on the screen, you know, mm -hmm. but in the mm -hmm. room. I mean, kids, infants don't learn from screens. You know, they get, they're fascinated by them. They, they love them, you know, but that's, they don't learn. They learn from people because that's the kind of species we are. We are, we have a long period of vulnerability. We have to learn, you know, how to survive in the world. And we look to grown up people, you know, we want to please our parents. We want to please our teachers. And that's where motivation comes from. And motive, you don't have learning without motivation. You just don't have it. I mean, a kid has got to want to learn. And we learn from other people. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can't substitute a screen for that. You no, can you supplement it, of course, and in, no. in useful ways, but you can't substitute yeah, yeah I, that's that's what I see on the positive end. We do have some. Uh, you and I can talk today through this technology. Uh, if yeah, if, exactly. Ten, ten years ago, if you put yeah. out a book, uh, yeah. how are yeah. we going to do this? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. it would be yeah. difficult. You, uh, I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know exactly what what to do. And yeah. might have been able to do something through Skype, but that was not developed yet. And uh, I know, no. Uh, so uh, you're part of a series here that I'm doing, as you know. And uh, I, I could um, the original grant that I put out was meant. It, it only could have we we might have had six scholars visit Tokyo over mm -hmm. three years. Yeah. And yeah. I've talked. Yeah. I think you are. Uh, we're in the 40s now. Yeah. So I, yeah. I I I find that to be much better than trying to select, you know, because there's so many good people out it's there. It's wonderful. Know? I know. And when I want to know about somebody or somebody's work, I just go on to YouTube. I find their lectures. You know, I don't have to go to their talks. I don't have, I mean, it's, it's really, truly wonderful. It's just, it's just, you know, I mean, where this online that Bill Gates kind of computerized learning uh, worked was with people who knew already how to use, I mean, they were educated, they weren't kids, you know, so that's a big difference. I mean, a series like this, I mean, it's terrific. I mean, it gets the word out. Um, it can be used by all sorts of other, you know, scholars and grownups, but they're grownups, you know, they're not people who are learning the kind of basics. Yeah, I, I like to think of it, too, as something of a pushback, just to talk about what your, your subject is. Uh, if you want to uh, paint us as a, a bunch of, you um, post Maoist indoctrinators <laughs> of young people where we come yeah. in and uh, tell yeah. them that uh, yeah. uh, they yeah. need to consider being another gender or they need to do that. When you meet these people that uh, I'm talking to, that's not this, or they're in their Ivy tower. They have ascots and pipes. Right. They think they're better right. than we are. And right. it's harder. Da, da, right. da. You see these people for who they are, how hard they work, yeah. Uh, how yeah. committed they are, how much they love doing what they do. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's one that's that's one little small weapon in the in the fight against this uh, uh, this drive to eliminate us, which Absolutely. it really is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
and That's also huge... we, we we get to know each other yeah because yeah. uh you go oh that guy isn't a smug uh <laughs> bastard out of uh oxford he's actually a kind of obsequious guy who just works really hard on footnotes <laughs> that have know. helped me a lot you know in my uh teaching of shakespeare annotations you know the people who yeah. do these yeah. things yeah are often yeah. just extraordinarily nice and interesting and we we get to meet them I mean, it's it's actually a wonderful instrument because it's humanizing a stereotype. And as you say, there are so many stereotypes of academics out there. And and yeah, meet us, talk to us, and that's uh, you know, you you you'll be surprised. Um, um, well, what I what I feel, uh, Gail, this is part of a sub uh, sub part. I'm I'm wanting to get more educators on and bring education in, mm -hmm. and I'm looking for ways to talk about Shakespearean education, and that of course uh, is scalable to all humanities. I mean, we we mm -hmm. could put what you're doing with Shakespeare, you could take into um, uh, Arthur Miller, you could take into uh, a Russian novelist. Uh, and you could uh, bring it into uh, women writers. I and, do. I, and, I, I, and I'm sure you yeah. do. And I do remember the time when there needed to be more women introduced into the canon of study. Yeah. My goodness, it was awful. Uh, yeah. If you go back to the 70s, you know, you'd go yeah. to a, a class on the history of the novel and yeah. the professor would just not think to put either Wharton or Virginia something. Wolf, you know, Virginia Woolf, you know, I never read Virginia Emily Wolf. Dickinson. Come yeah. on, you know, yeah. these are yeah. these are big form people sure. uh, yeah. and uh, have, have, uh, did I, have moved me more than maybe some of the other canonical figures uh, that are brought in. So... I know. I mean, I, you know, and one of the things I try to uh, points I try to get across in the book is the uses of Shakespeare, because we're accused of being useless. I mean, what good are they for? What good are the humanities for? You know, it's not going to improve my salary and so forth, which is a lie. I mean, actually, uh, liberal arts degrees do get people into, you know, considerably they're good wage earners but you have to wait until mid-career kind of to find that That's out right. that doesn't happen right away yeah. but the uses of shakespeare are just incredible because you know for one thing these are people relating to other people interpreting other people reading other people and you see how um you're trying to get them to read the plays but you're also reading about characters who are reading other characters gets a little complicated and are reading badly and that's the source of tragedy I and mean, if you look at every one of his tragic heroes they're really bad readers i mean and that's what happens they listen to the wrong people i mean macbeth oh no don't <laughs> don't listen to that woman don't <laughs> listen to which is othello uh -uh. Uh, <laughs> there are better, you know, I mean, it, you know, Lear, uh, no, why don't you try hearing what, you know, Cordelia is actually saying? And, and, and Brutus, I mean, how can he be swayed by Cassius and brought into a coup, a bloody political coup for which he is not equipped? He is so ill-equipped. I mean, I think I would be better equipped. Than I know. <laughs> you know, United so States. they listen to the wrong people. They're bad readers. And it's like an object lesson in good reading. You know, you have mm -hmm. to like, I mean, what do they do wrong? We spend a lot of time, you know, where are their blind spots? Why are they so stupid? They're not stupid characters, but they're stupid mm -hmm. about themselves. And they listen to the wrong people. That's really a survival skill. I mean, if you can get across half yeah. of that, you know, listen, look, read, interpret. I mean, you know, you live in a world of human beings who are trying to manipulate you. You know, people have agenda. I mean, more than ever now, PR and advertising and, you know, join this and be this and think this way. Uh, -uh. You have to think for yourself. You have to figure out how to read the world. And I mean, what better, uh, you know, writer than Shakespeare for that? He's just yeah. full of bad examples. You know? yeah. How Absolutely. not to? <laughs> well, I uh, I wanted to bring up one example. I have a, a friend who was very 
uh, very much pushed his daughter to go into uh, uh, pharmacology rather than uh, humanities. Yeah. And she, because you step out and you step out into a six figure job, which is good money for a young yeah. person. Sure, of course. Uh, good money for uh, everybody. But I, uh, the, uh, so she, she did it and uh, she gets to work in a Walmart. That's where you have a pharmacy. Yeah. So the, uh, and I uh, spoke with her about this and she says, yeah, I stand on my feet 10 hours a day. I go like he said. Even Walmart mm -hmm. shoppers don't want to spend all day in Walmart. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, so that's my life. I make the money, I know. I and know. Uh, but and I've talked to scores of other people who have made the money, people yeah. who have dropped out and gone into teaching, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I felt more fulfilled because of that. <clears throat> and uh, and of course, people who have that flexibility. I know people who were accounting majors, engineering majors, who felt some regret that they didn't learn more in college yeah. about the stuff yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's just so abundantly clear that you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to get to the, uh, to the kind of ending that you go into about why is this? Why, when we're uh, you, you, when we're forming these narratives, whether they come over on cable news or in certain publications, uh, why is it that uh, whatever journalists, business managers, they never seem to walk down to the fac uh, factory floor. They never seem to get on a in a car and drive to um, Southern Virginia and walk into an elementary school and see if yeah. the teachers are actually you know, flogging their students with uh, gender identity. They yeah. never uh, seem, right. it, it, they never right. seem to come and talk to us and, sh or sit in our classrooms and they don't talk to our graduates. Uh, some of whom are among these people. Uh, there's just no, <laughs> and that's yeah. what you do toward the yeah. end. You talk yeah. about that. That is, yeah. don't, don't talk to us about us until you talk to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's proof positive. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it, it's uh, education is talked about by top down experts who really don't know anything about it. And the media is really complicit in this because when they add, you know, do an article on K 12 or something, they talk to the business person because they really respect business more than they do teachers. Why? Because businessmen make more money than teachers and everybody money talks, everybody respects money. So somebody like Bill Gates, who is a college dropout, you know, can devise this, uh, the skin, the common core is really kind of his brainchild. And it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. And it's this top a, a documented, down. a document. It's not just Gail saying this. This is a documented <laughs> disaster. <laughs> Many yep. people saying yes. it. Read Diane Ravitch. I mean, she's kind of the, the word on this because yep. she was part of the planning of No Child Left Behind and high stakes exam. And then she realized what it was, was opening up education as a market. You know, it was just for marketeers and for profiteers. And she became a whistleblower very courageous to change her position since she was high up in the bush, you know, anyway, that's, that's a whole other story, but it's, uh, it's just, so here we are saddled with these schemes and, you know, these assessments, testing measurements and opinions that get magnified in the, in the press. And one of the things I really recommend is when you read an article about education, check out the authors, check your source, find out who their funding is, find out what think tank they're from and who funds that think tank. And it often comes back to these, you know, this, this handful of billionaires, really, who has a better mousetrap, you know. I think Gates is probably well-intentioned. I don't think he set out to destroy the educational system, no. which is what he's pretty much yeah. done. Uh, that, that's, how, that's, the, that's how you paved the path to hell, right? Uh, in, yeah, it's in really... Yeah. Really. But and there's so much misinformation about uh, teaching and teachers. And, and you've described some of it, the stereotypes, you know, the crazy wokes who are trying to get you to change your identity um, and the ivory tower out of it and, and all these, you know, stereotypes and and the media perpetuates them. But some of it's sinister. I mean, some of it is actually funded by people who want you to think that way. Some of it's just ignorance. You know, a lot of it's ignorance. So, yeah, it's kind of a social media hysteria. Yeah. And, yeah, and dis yeah. Discontented souls. 
And invariably, though, Gail, I'll listen to a podcast and somebody will come on and I will agree with most of what they say. And then we'll say, well, you know, the university is where all this starts. That's where these kids are told about how, you know, to be woke. That's how they're indoctrinated. And I want to I want to jump into the podcast and say, would you look and throw out a few curse words at a map of the Ohio State University and how many engineers they graduated, how many people in the medical sciences they graduated last year and all of these other places? And then look at how many people graduated in gender studies, if they could have the program. That cannot be the wellspring, the source. I think there's, uh, I think some of the vocabulary out of these, uh, uh, you know, post-structuralists or critical thinking, some of the vocabulary has been adopted by people on social media, and then Mm -hmm. somehow reached into the corporate world. No, it's, it's as you say, there's a certain social media um, hysteria, but there's also, I don't know, there's always been an anti-intellectualism in America that's really come to the fore, you know, I mean, a real kind of desire to kill higher education. There's a lot of jealousy. I mean, I think they know that some of us are having fun, you know, some of us have actually enjoyed our jobs, which is not what many people can say in this culture. Uh, in this society. Well, I do, well, Gail, in closing, though, uh, what I would like to point out is that, you know, if you go to my background, I won't uh, be indulgent here, but you came through. It wasn't easy. You were teaching as an adjunct at uh, the yeah. in the Cooney system, and yeah. you're there yeah. trying to yeah. uh, pay rent in New York City, a lot lower then than it is now, but it yeah. is not an easy yeah. road. You're yeah. working with these people, uh, front line, first yeah. generation people yeah, from yeah. not um uh, wealthy homes and moving into the kind of more ivory tower of columbia and finishing yeah. up a dissertation yeah. at yeah. the same time uh this is not easy stuff that we did right. and we no. that we may have paid a little bit forward and sometimes we do get some flexibility down the road and of course yeah. now everybody has to publish everybody has to sit on committees all da 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 and um uh, and then f- fill out forms for uh, assessment forms, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, that uh, I- anybody wants to call this an easy road, uh, no. and try it. Give it a try. Yeah, and, this is true. Uh, and th- I came across a really interesting. You know how conservatives think, say, "Oh well, they ne- you know never hire us, and we're not represented in academia, and they're all left wingers and stuff." I mean, this study said pointed out that conservatives tend to take themselves off the track. They don't want to get PhD. Uh-uh. They don't want to do this. It's hard. It's hard. Are not terrific. I mean, yeah. they're just not. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a family to support, so my my wage was fine for me. You know. Also, I had a supportive family of origin, but. Um, you know, it's not. I mean, if I looked at my colleagues who were who were who had three and four kids, and I thought, how do they do it? You know, this is like it's a living wage, but it's not. Anyway, conservatives they don't want that. You know, they take themselves off. That they don't go for PhDs. They go for business degrees. They're not well represented in academia because they don't want to be. Yeah. That's an important point to get across. I mean, I really think you know we're not selecting against them. They're selecting themselves. I'm painting with a very broad brush here, I know, yeah. but um, and I can give you the reference. It's it's in the book, um, that study, uh, that was very interesting. Yeah, and yeah, also you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to go from the West Coast to what, Chicago. You were at the University of Chicago for a, a short period, and and then to the East Coast, and then when the job comes open yeah. at a place you didn't know that well, you take it. And yeah, just exactly. hope for the best yeah. because you yeah. were from, yeah. you yeah. grew up yeah. more closer to Palo Alto, I think, which yeah. is now very Palo Alto, but it wasn't when yeah. you were coming up. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. uh, Scripps is another world yeah. uh, down down south. And so yeah. uh, you have to be willing to do that. You know, right. we are right. uh, journey people uh, yeah. in that regard. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, if you're yeah, if you're willing to do all of that, all right, you you can slip out uh, 15 years later when you manage to get your salary going and things settled and shoot around to golf on Tuesday afternoon. Sorry, 
you know, we get, we get to do that. <laughs> I know that would be me, and not very good golf. You write I, I, books in my spare time. But I, we, um, I, I, there were some guys at this club said, "You professors don't ever work." You know, here you out playing golf, and I'm retired. And I, go, I know, I know, I hear that all the time. Yeah, it could be tennis yeah. for someone I'm else. A long a day in my shoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, yeah, exactly. It's another stereotype to break down. I mean, and teachers, poor teachers, oh like, oh, goodness. they get all that vacation. Teachers oh, never get vacation. No, I mean, it's, they are the hardest working people in the world. Um, oh, my. And the least appreciated. And the least appreciated. I and think they're the wasn't, heroes of our time. That wasn't always the case, you know. Yeah. Oh, I know. I mean, when I went to school, first of all, there were more men, in, you know, and now it's th three quarters women because the men, yeah. <laughs> they try to get out. But it's, um, you know, they were paid what NFL players were paid. They were paid the same salary as engineers. They were respected. Now they're like a punching bag. Yeah. And it's a, it's a horrible it's thing. Just, it is. It's all And they're leaving and they're not replenishing the pipeline. People don't want to go into teaching anymore. The right wing doesn't care at all because all you do is lower the credentials. And now all you have to do is have a BA, you know, and in some states, not even a BA. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. Really, yeah. And then we'll turn it over to machines anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's one of the things that led me to Japan because the, uh, uh, the professorate is still viewed as part of the corporate structure, so the uh, the pay scales are much better. To, to put it uh, bluntly, that's and, nice. And yeah. What what yeah. drew me because I yeah. was I was going under, okay. uh, I and, and I, I was know. no spring chicken, and no. I knew two words of Japanese. So basically, I had to move here, learn a new language, and adapt to this culture. Mm -hmm which is not <laughs> heaven on earth all the time. It has been great for me. Yeah. Uh, but there's there's yeah. some of these these problems that we're talking about now uh, are in, encroaching in my colleagues, my Japanese colleagues, and no, I uh, no, talk about no, this. No, and no. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but th that was, I just remember uh, talking to my college roommate who became an eye surgeon. And I said, you know, John, look, when when I decided to go into this business, I knew you were going to make three times more than I, you know, maybe right. four. Wow. I didn't know you were going to make 20 times more than I make, you know, uh, or, you know, <laughs> somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. And, uh, and I, I just think we should get paid a little more. We were paid so miserably when I first started. It was awful. Yeah. And he said, if you want more money, you're going to have to find a job with more that pays more money, which kind of irritated me at the time but i thought about it and i go okay i'm yeah. flying to japan yeah so, interesting okay. really uh, so uh, yeah I, I um i don't all these all the people out there don't have this advantage and of course we could go on and on about the people who have been put in a kind of hell of uh of teaching part-time uh there's oh, a yeah. whole large class of of and, uh, adjunct and, professors and growing yeah. yeah yeah and here too here in in yeah. tokyo too yeah yeah. Uh, it tends to pay a bit better and you tend to be able to get to place to place easier than, uh, than you, you know, the freeway flyers, you know, the, I the, know. The, I know. but, uh, but that that's, that's for another time. And yeah. that's just to me greed, because I think yeah. you could Ex set up exploitation. A, yeah. an exploitation. It really yeah. is. It's horrible. It, it is it, horrible. It is. A, it's a horrible thing. And, and I just hope that there's enough of a rear guard action here, a counter force or something, uh, leadership among maybe younger people coming up. Well, the um, strikes, the strikes have been good news. I mean, a huge UC strike and, uh -huh. uh, you know, they didn't get enough out of it, but they got a lot. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm a union man. We have a union here and it saved, yeah. it saved our butts. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. About 10 I years know. Ago. Yeah, and yeah. I can't go into great detail about that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll go down to Union Hall and sing the song and, and stand the line. Yeah. Uh, it didn't come to that; it came to more of a legalistic yeah. thing, and yeah. was all solved yeah. very um, civilly. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the that's that's what I, you know, the good old um, uh, answers to the old questions, you know, or the old problems, the same old solutions. You have to bind together. Hold United we stand, you know, and that's what this this horrible the, the encroachment of managerial administration assessments. 
I wish faculty would stand up to that. No, I found I've, I just have not found a lot of faculty. I mean, they they make fun of it. They fudge it. They lie. They think they're getting away with something. It's not funny. And it's no. not you're not getting away with something. No. You need to stand up and like and say, you know, this sucks. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. This is an encroachment and infringement, waste of resources, waste of time. I retired. You know, frankly, that was one of the things that pushed me out. Yeah. And I have talked to more people who have done that. And so what they're doing I, I is getting rid, getting rid of the the critic the critics. The critics leave, you know, if they can. Yeah. And the young people who are used to assessment, who are used to, you know, I I, I don't know, they just bend and meet and so there's and no reason. They, they will be destroyed. Yeah, in it will destroy cases. the system. I mean, even yeah, if they, they get will, away with it personally for a while, it will destroy the system. And they yeah. has to, they will to. be destroyed. You know, if you don't get tenure, you're just uh, you're a leper out there. Yeah. And, uh, and even if you do get tenure, you're going to watch the system go down the toilet. I mean, because that's what's happening. And, you know, they really it makes me very I mean, that is one of the things that gets me really heated under the collar about, you know, like talking to people. Oh, well, we just fudged in. It was fun. Uh -uh, yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. There, there needs to be much more solidarity in yeah. all of this. And right. and let's hope uh, because uh, our um, our star is uh, whatever it was. You know, it, we, we just don't it's going to take time and effort and organization. Uh, and uh, people who are savvy in media uh, manipulation, who know how to get points across. Yeah. Uh, and we hope to have help from politicians, from people of influence. I, I do see a new uh, generation of business leaders who would be on our side. Uh, oh, nice. and, uh, and particularly in tech. Mm -hmm. uh, because they go, mm -hmm. you know, we, we can hire programmers all day long, but we need people who can think. Right. Uh, I heard a, a talk from a woman with Intel who was doing uh, uh, Native American studies at Stanford, and she was snapped up by Intel and said, yes, we need yeah. you to tell women across the world that they can do that they can do our kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and to show them mm -hmm. what we're doing we want you to because we're all a bunch of guys here yeah and yeah. uh and she has uh found her way uh doing that and they didn't care that she was an expert in you know whatever native american history mm -hmm. uh they wanted somebody who could communicate uh right, on right. global scale and they had yeah. smart people there who knew yeah. you know who approached her and you yeah. know, listened to her. So yeah. there's some yeah. great stories out there. And I think that we might see some kind of transformative uh, period. Uh, and, and they haven't done away with us yet. Uh, <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> uh, well, there's one quick story. They tried to, the uh, Ministry of Education, there was a group in there. It's this big, I'm not going to equate it to a Death Star, but the uh, this is huge Ministry of Education in Japan, and one group in there has decided we're, our national universities, funded by the people, really don't need these uh, humanities uh, schools, and we can save all this money. And uh, went so far as yeah, they drafted yeah. it, and a couple yeah. of the national universities, the, the lower level ones, did get rid of their School of Humanities. And when that got out to the University of Tokyo, and what in Japan are these, I mean, untouchable elite institutions, Kyoto. It's just a sort of, are you kidding me? We're not going to be teaching the history of the Japanese language to the Japanese people anymore. Da, wow. da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. That could be apocryphal, but mm -hmm. something happened there and it died. That whole thing died. Mm -hmm. And then there was an issue saying we just didn't proofread our... Um, we didn't proofread our policy statement well enough, and we've corrected that problem now. Uh, so they wow. backed off. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they hit yeah. a wall with that. And I imagine some careers were destroyed and yeah. good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, very interesting. That's like yeah. the Scott Walker story where he said, oh, well, you know, his he changed the admi the uh, mission statement of the University of Wisconsin. That's right. The, the governor, the governor yeah, of Wisconsin, yeah. the state of Wisconsin. Yes. Right. Instead of the search for truth and social something or other, it was, you know, to serve workforce needs. And they said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? No. 
And he had, he said, oh, that was a proofing error, you know. No, you're not coming in here and stripping the varnish off of our institution. Right, right. Yeah. Well, there needs to be more of that. And, you yeah. know, I, I just hope there is. Anyway, my book is a part of that sort of mission to kind of <laughs> save it's, the humanities. It's going to take a lot of us, you know. I know, uh, I know. Gail, I know. it's not going to, it's going to take a lot of us to do this uh you think about the great cathedrals and anything that's been built is great and you think who did this and the answer is always a lot of people yeah and, uh, and how easy it is to destroy you can destroy a cathedral with a well-placed bomb that's right. and that's what's happening you know it's yeah. like yeah it's, it's so much easier to destroy than to create <clears throat> it is so much easier uh I'm going to close off. I could I yeah. could talk with you for hours upon hours yeah, about this. Just, fun. <laughs> and one of the points here in this series is that we do open up things like uh, in conversation mm -hmm. uh, rather than a formalized interview, uh, mm -hmm. that kind mm -hmm. of thing, uh, which I'm sure in this book you're going to be doing plenty of. Uh, <laughs> so uh, good luck with that. If I may ask you to stay after we finish recording to debrief just a moment. And uh, but before that, I wanted to thank you again. I have colleagues, all of my colleagues in Japan are deeply involved with educational uh, theory. They're interested in how to present uh, Shakespeare uh, to their students. Uh, humanities literary study is not done on the high school level, on the grade school level in Japan. And uh, a couple of my younger colleagues are working to say, you know, ask that question, why not? Why don't we do? And uh -huh. so in the university, we we do some of it, but sometimes we're with students who have, you know, no background in it to begin with. Uh, and there are people who are teaching Shakespeare all over the world and teaching mm -hmm. literature all over the world who uh, I hope could listen to some of this and get some get some ideas. But if you really want a lot of ideas, go to your book and and read that book. There's some wonderful stories in there, and it's almost like after after I get angry, it's almost like Gail is saying, "Okay, now I'm going to tell you some stories about my students, and we're going to lighten up a little bit here. You know, bring in some <laughs> comic relief in some cases." Uh, it's so brilliantly uh, written and the character descriptions are just worthy of uh, even some of the best kinds of fiction. And uh, again, thank you so very much for joining us thank today. You. It's been great. Okay, Thanks. Bye-bye.